Okay, you're on camera. Today is April 29th, 2016. We're at the Atlanta History Center in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, with me today is Sue Verhoff, who is the senior archivist at the History Center. My name is Joe Bruckner, and I'm a volunteer at the History Center. And we're honored to have with us today Mr. Rich Glickstein. Mr. Glickstein is a veteran of the U.S. Navy and has agreed to come in and talk to us about his service in the Navy and his life in general. Uh, this is part of the Library of Congress Veterans History Project, and f following this interview, Mr. Glickstein's story will be put on the record with the Atlanta History Center and the Library of Congress. Uh, Mr. Glickstein, we really appreciate you coming in here and look forward to hearing about your life. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <clears throat> Could you give us your full name and the city and state where you currently live? So my name is Richard Brian Glickstein, uh, and I live in Atlanta, uh, which is kind of a rarity. Um, uh, so I live in Atlanta, Georgia. Where and when were you born? I was born on 21 December 1969, so there's a mm -hmm. key point of military. I can't, yes. say, I can't say dates another way. Yeah. Um, and I was born in Park Ridge, Illinois, just outside of Chicago. Okay. Tell us a little bit about your upbringing. Um, so, lived in Chicago. My, my family moved from Chicago when I was five years old. Um, I was, was uh, uh, moved from Chicago down to um, North Miami Beach, Florida. Um, so, I moved, when I was five years old, I started first grade down there, of course. Um, growing up for a short time up uh, in Palatine, Illinois, um, just outside of Chicago, I mean, snow packs up to here. Hmm. Um, and then, of course, I think my dad got sick of it and said, "No, we're, we're moving down to Florida, <laughs> um, where where his parents lived. Actually, um, they moved down from New York City. Um, so we moved actually about three miles away from from my grandparents, which was kind of nice um, growing up. Um, you know, grew up. I actually was. I guess I was one of the first ish latchkey kids. So mom was a professional." Um, Dad was an attorney. My mother was a speech pathologist in Dade County Schools, um, and so, and of course, through my childhood, she was uh, getting a couple of other master's degrees uh, to bolster her education and continue uh, working. So she was a, a, she worked in the schools for uh, about thirty years, um, and my dad was a, a trial attorney in Miami. Um, so I, I, I guess it was pretty run of the mill. Um, I guess you know, and I fell on the, the half that uh, the parents divorced and. So my f folks, uh, when I was about 13 years old, they decided that okay. uh, their marriage wasn't working out, and <clears throat> at that time, lived with mom, lived with dad a little bit, and um, I, I, I think that's about it. Unless there's any. Do you have any brothers or sisters? Yeah, my so my sister's three years older than I am, um, and she she kind of escaped the, the divorce. Um, she went to uh, the University of Florida, right? Actually, at the end of that semester so she finished high school and went to college uh, straight away um, and so she missed a lot of uh, you know it was an amicable divorce I'm not saying they were they were, yeah. they were awful to me uh, or to both of us um, right. but uh, you know it's still a 13 14 15 year old kid it wasn't fun when you got out of high school did you go to college or did what did you do then no I fit when I finished high school I actually I left high school early um, and uh, I hung around actually was a musician in high school, and so I actually played in bar bands, and I was I was an electric bass player. So um, I, I played, uh, uh, you know, got hooked up with a couple of bar bands, and um, we just played out, made a little bit of money there. I still lived with dad, uh, and then about eight months or so after I uh, left school, uh, decided to get a GED when I when I came of majority age. Um, and uh, and shortly after that, I actually went to community college for about a year. Um, spent a year doing that, and then toward the end of that, I uh, raised my right hand. So I found a recruiter and um, said, "Okay, so what do you got for me?" What prompted <coughs> you to go into the military, and ha how did your parents feel about you going in? You know, I. What prompted me is is actually I hear this a lot from a lot of the clients that I work with now is. Not a geographical cure, but I wanted something to kind of jumpstart what I was, mm -hmm. what I was doing. Yeah. Um, it, it just seemed like, my, I mean, Miami has a lot to offer. Don't get me wrong. I mean, I, I love my hometown, especially going back to it now with all the mm -hmm. wonderful diversity there. Um, but it just seemed at the time when I was 19 years old, it's okay. It's kind of stifling. I, 
I feel a little bit suffocated, and I, I, I got a, I had a case of the gotta goes. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so <laughs> I, I gotta go. <laughs> um, so I found a recruiter, um, and the other thing that was really interesting, my, um, and it sounds trivial, but my grandfather, who was actually a World War II veteran, um, never went to, never deployed, never uh, went to Europe. He was injured and mm -hmm. uh, came home, from what I understand. Um, he was enamored with military service. And so he took me to see, in 1976, when I was six years old, um, the Battle of Midway. Mm -hmm. and, and the interesting thing about the Battle of Midway was the reason why we won it, the reason why the Americans came out on top um, was because of naval cryptology and breaking codes and, and um, intercepting radio communications. And it just was, f it, it was cool, it was fun. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I really liked the idea of, of gathering little bits of information, being able to put together uh, basically a bigger picture and make a really good educated guess. Mm -hmm. And so <clears throat> when I went to the recruiter, um, they sat me down and they said, okay, so here's what we have. Actually, at the recruiter, went to the MEPS and, and at MEPS, they sat me down and they put these, these cards of, of job descriptions. I think one was uh, radioman, uh, one was sonar tech submarines, another one was uh, electronics technician submarines, and a fourth one was operations specialist. The OS, the operations specialist looked like it was the most fun. Um, but I said, do, do I have to know stuff? Of course, I used a different vernacular. <laughs> but I said, do I have to know stuff to do my job here? And they said, well, you get a clearance. And I said, that's not, you didn't answer my question. So falling back on my dad's trial attorney, he was like, no, do you, ha do you have to know stuff? <laughs> and they said, well, no. And I said, well, give me a job, you gotta know stuff. <laughs> and they dropped this card in front of me that said cryptologic technician, and I read it, and it told me absolutely nothing. <laughs> It, I, there were there were all these words. It was like this whole like card full of words, and it told me zero of what I would do as a job. It said I'd learn Morse code, um, security, uh, like I don't know electronic security and and security measures, and I'd learn so communications. That was it. That's all it said, and it said it was a 22 week long A school. And, and I said, well, what do I have to? What is this? And they said, well, you're a spy, you're a spook. And, and this is my, the recruiter, who actually, rare occurrence, never lied to me, was completely honest with me. He said, and he was a submariner. He said, well, you're a spook. What the hell does that mean? He says, well, you do stuff, we don't know what you do. <laughs> and, I said, and I said, great, sign me up. <laughs> so, so I said, sign me up, outstanding. Um, and that was, that was really, what was really fantastic. So it was either learn Morse. Um, it was it was one way or the other. The the detailer would dis would decide which way I would go. It would either CTR or CTT. So it was either learn Morse and learn how to intercept communications and understand um, uh, message traffic and, and stuff like that, or learn telemetry and electronics and um, uh, radars and whatnot and intercept that type okay. of stuff, non communication stuff. And I went the former. Um, <clears throat> which was exactly what I wanted to do yeah. because that's exactly what was happening at this place in Hawaii where they decrypted okay. all the communications from World War II in the Pacific. Wow. So this was, you know, it was like kind of like a life circle a little yeah. bit. Yeah. Um, and it was exactly what I wanted and I really, really enjoyed it. Were your parents supportive of you going in? Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> so. So I'm Jewish. I'm the only schmuck in my family to volunteer. Um, my dad's uh, younger brother, one younger brother, uh, was drafted in the Army. I think he was an Army medic. Um, I'm not sure he deployed. I, I don't think he was uh, sent to Vietnam, but he was in the military during that time frame. Um, my grandfather's brother, uh, Eddie, was a Marine. He was drafted as a Marine. I do believe he deployed to Vietnam. Um, but I'm the only guy that was that volunteered and who, who stepped up. Okay. Um, my parents, my parents have, or, or had, they passed away. My parents, um, my mother has had two master's degrees. My dad was an attorney. So, being mm -hmm. Jews from the city and whatever they want to have, they want their kids to get an education. Yeah. Um, and at the time, 
I'd left high school under odd conditions. I had an okay GPA in, in community college, but I didn't really see it going anywhere. And the laws in Florida didn't prescribe like they do now. If you get an AA um, at a two-year school, you'll go, you're immediately accepted into one of the Florida state yeah. schools. Yeah. Um, that wasn't, that, okay. as far as I know, it, it, it might have been. Yeah. Um, and so I, I saw it as, let's go and do something. Let's go and, and okay. see the world. Um, they weren't, my dad was, my dad kind of, he was like, you did what? <laughs> 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 um, and he kind of warmed up to it after a little yeah. while. But, uh, yeah. Well, I'm sure he was proud of you eventually for he, what you did. Yeah, he was. He was. I think I, I mean, I, I took him through the ringer. Um, n not necessarily like on purpose. But each deployment I went on, especially the first one, was, was kind of like, and this is something I, I talk to my clients about, um, to not being a parent myself, but, I, but knowing what children can do by doing this to my dad. Um, it's like grabbing a giant rope and just yanking it. And he, has, he, he can do nothing. You know, my mom can do nothing. Yeah. But whatever adventures the child goes on, they want the safety and they're powerless. Yeah. And I can only, I can imagine it from that side, you know, how powerful that is. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, he, uh, they were proud of me. They, they told me as such. Good. So. Talk about your military service, uh, the, your training. Uh, <coughs> you had some, some, a number of assignments that all look extremely interesting. So mm -hmm. just take us through what you did. So, so I was in for six years. Um, I joined, or I, I swore in on August 23rd, 89, and then <laughs> left North Miami Beach. I went to Orlando um, for boot camp. Um, so it was, it was a quick, it was like, go to MEPS, do the final physical stuff, take the urinalysis, get on the airplane, fly to Orlando, and I was literally there by 8.30 at night, which was fantastic because everybody's coming from all over the dang country. And <laughs> it was really funny. I remember getting in my rack at 10.30. I mean, I had a good solid six hours of sleep. Couldn't believe it. Um, got in my rack at, at 10.30, and I, I laid down, and I'm looking at the rack above me, and I'm sitting there thinking, holy crap, what the hell have I done? <laughs> <laughs> um, so anyway, so, so boot camp there, which was, which was kind of nice, although it was a pretty hot time of year yeah. in August and September. Um, and then went to Fort Devens, Massachusetts for uh, a school to learn how to do this cryptology business. Um, so learned, uh, literally learned how to type, then learned Morse, um, which will never, it's just burned on my brain. Um, and then uh, finished that, first command was uh, Subic Bay, Naval Security Group Detachment Subic Bay. Um, which the main job at Subic was to deploy. So we were, um, we were put in place to both service ships as they came in with, the, with our maintenance folks, and then also um, take our guys, uh, our uh, collectors, so guys like me, and go out and do, uh, get on deployments and, and go out to sea and go and do six month long missions. Um, and so that was, so this was around, let's see, I got there in June of 1990. Yeah, got there in June of 1990. About three months after, um, a Marine was murdered by a, um, a local guy who was, some um, affair was going on, and they just shuttered the base for like two months. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I'm getting there, and my dad is freaking out. He's like, wait a second, you're going there, and they just did this? Don't worry, Dad, it's okay. <laughs> um, so anyway, so got to Subic at, uh, uh, in June of 90, and two months later, as we know, um, on August 2nd, 1990, we had a little invasion. Yeah. And I said, oh, no, no, no. I'm talking to my phone. No, they'll never send me. Everything will be fine. Don't worry about it. I have no experience. None at all. <clears throat> None. Um, and sure enough, uh, they said, pack your sea bag. <laughs> <laughs> you're going to sea. Battle Group Alpha is getting underway from Japan, and you're going to be on um, the Bunker Hill. Um, so I said, okay, <laughs> what do I do? <laughs> so anyway, so um, uh, got underway from, uh, we flew up to Yokosuka, from, to Yokosuka, Japan, got underway, um, and my first deployment was the Gulf War. Wow. Um, so 
the, the interesting thing about that is we did almost, and this is not to, to sell what the operations specialists and the um, command staff and all that stuff did because um, the CIC actually ran the air corridor and the air uh, area, but we as collectors, we didn't. We did some other things. Um, and we had a couple of linguists on board that kept track of a couple of countries around there. Um, and it was it was kind of boring <laughs> well, <laughs> up I, until January. <laughs> and I realize there may be there may be some information you are restricted from sharing, but can you give us any detail about what yes, what countries you were monitoring and what type of conversations you were monitoring? And well, <coughs> pardon me. Um, actually. I can't tell you exactly what I was doing, but if you think about for a second, we were there to prosecute a potential war against Iraq. Okay. Um, yeah. I think that might lend a little bit yeah. of clue, yeah. but I, I can't really talk a little bit or right. more in detail about right. the specific stuff that yeah. I was copying. I understand. Uh, other people may, um, but that's just one thing that I just I just yeah. can't do. Well, I understand that. Um, and and the same thing for for um, for the linguists and stuff that were on board. There were. Let's just say there are a couple of countries that we might see threatening yeah. um, in the area, and we've got to kind of keep tabs on that, too. Okay. Um, well, within the realm of what you are allowed to talk about, just go through some of your experiences. And so I, I remember a couple of really fun things. Um, one interesting thing is that, and I guess this might have been a little bit of a precursor to my, to my um, career after the military. While I was in community college, I was taking photography classes, and I was really enamored with news gathering. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and I'd actually gone and shot news pictures just for a fun assignment um, for this art class or something like that. And so while I was on board, while we were at sea, it was, I would have at the top of the hour one ear on my targets as the receiver was rolling through, and the other ear was listening to the BBC. And oh. gathering, just, just listening to the news because yeah. the BBC transmits on HF. And so does Voice of America, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So um, I'd jot down uh, little notes from the BBC um, and little bits for, of news and pass it up to the bosun mates to actually talk about over the 1MC, huh. which, was kind of, yeah. which was kind of fun. It's like, you know, hey, here's a little bit of news. Yeah. Um, so one of the interesting things that happened is right around... I can't remember the exact date, but right around my birthday, it was um, in December, um, Saddam Hussein decided to let all of his human shields, so to speak, go home. Um, and this is something I heard over on, on uh, FRTS from Bahrain or the BBC that I was listening to on the, on the HF. Um, and for some, some reason it clicked. I was like, well, he's letting them all. I was like, that's it. We're going to war. It's going to happen. Because no no leader in his right mind would keep all those people here. Mm -hmm. It's gonna we're gonna go to war. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and you know, I mean, think back. You know, I'm 20 years old. I turned 21 out at sea. Um, we pulled into Bahrain on the 24th of December for two days. We didn't even know if we were gonna get liberty because of potential mm -hmm. terrorism or whatever. Um, and you know, it's like, okay, so have a last hurrah before we start launching missiles. Um, and then sure enough, the president at the time said, you know, you've got until X time period. Um, that passes and it's just okay, let's, you know, brace for shock. Um, but uh, the, other, the other thing that we were, we were doing, and so bef leading up to that point, the other thing we were doing, the mission of the, of the ship was controlling the air corridor and, and um, uh, combat air patrols and stuff like that, which I wasn't a part of. Um, but we were also looking for um, uh, shipping that was breaking um, sanctions against uh, against oh. Iraq. Yeah. So, and I'm, we didn't have boarding parties, but there were other ships that um, had boarding parties that would go on board um, and try and find Iraqi mm -hmm. uh, shipping go, pulling into Basra yeah. or Umm Qasar or something like that. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so leading up to that, so on, on the 16th, probably around dinner time on the 16th, um, my work center found out 
that we were going to launch that that night. Um, and the rest of the ship didn't had no clue, had didn't know just yet. So it got it started getting passed down through the officers, um, and we found out, like I said, about six seven o'clock at night. Um, and then at uh, twelve thirty twelve forty or something like that. Um, they called away general quarters. We sat at general quarters for about an hour um, and then launched the first missiles from the Gulf. Um, if I'm not mistaken, I don't know if it was a fr is, if Bunker Hill launched the first from the, um, from the, you know, from either the Gulf or the Red Sea, but, uh, but we definitely launched the first from the Gulf. What ship were you on now? USS Bunker Hill. Oh, the Bunker was the ship you were on. Okay. Right. Okay. Right. We want to make sure throughout this that we know which, which, uh, ship that you were on so it'll be on the record so right right okay. no this is I was on Bunker Hill and okay. um, so my general quarter station wasn't um, being in uh, the ship signals exploitation space it was I was actually a chaff loader okay. so if we had to shoot chaff to um, um, I don't know divert missiles or something mm -hmm. like that that were shot at us um, my job would be to go out and reload oh okay um, along with uh, the electronic warfare specialists. So we were all in the same division. Um, but I, re I remember sitting there, I mean, I, I know we launched at, at 0141. I know that, I looked at my watch. It was one of those sentinel events in life, you know, I'll, I won't forget it. Um, you know, and, and don't get me wrong, my combat experience is, is so minimal. And, I'm not, and I know a lot of guys do this, and it's a very typical veteran behavior of the other guy had it much worse or much harder. But it's absolutely true. I mean, my combat experience is feeling and watching missiles fly from the from the ship, and that that was it. Um, but in that type of war, you were in danger everywhere you were because of the mm -hmm. lack of a better term, the terrorism. And and kind and basically, yeah, it, it, we were also in danger. Now that I'm looking back on it now, knowing what I know now, we were in danger because of. Um, poorly moored and poorly um, operated uh, sea mines. Uh, we were in danger because of poor equipment on the opponent's side, on our adversary side, um, and they couldn't predict where the stuff went. Um, so we had to keep a lookout and, and, and stuff like that. Um, but it was, it was just interesting, you know, sitting there and then the first thing, <laughs> the first thing I do, we hear the first bird fly away from the ship and it was it sounds like um, a tomahawk sounds, it's got a solid rocket booster, so it, I guess it kind of sounds like a little bit of a rocket ship. And I've, I'm from Florida, but I've never seen a, a launch before. But it just, there's this roar and it just shakes the whole damn ship. Um, and of course the first, the first thing, and this is one of the things that's colored my thinking over the, over the last 20 plus years is, okay, so how many people did we just kill? You know, and, and you know that's it's an important thing for me because looking back on the leadership, what I know about the Joint Chiefs and what the leadership were recommending, they were recommending to hold off and hold off and hold off and not do anything until you absolutely have to, because no service member in their right mind wants to go to war, but they do. It's the it's the yeah. yeah. So anyway, so that was the thought that I that I had, and of course the first reaction was to light a cigarette. I'm like, okay, holy crap, this is happening. <laughs> um, but anyway, so so yeah, so that's the first thought that I had. When this was going on, or shortly thereafter, you said you were, part of what you were doing was listening <clears throat> to the BBC. Were you able to simultaneously listen to what the World Press or BBC was reporting and how they were covering this? Yeah, a little bit. And, and what, what's really interesting about the BBC and the difference, especially having been worked in journalism, mm -hmm. what's really interesting about the difference between what the non-U.S. press does and what the U.S. press does is the non-U.S. press will give a very bigger picture, uh, very bigger, listen to me, uh, a much bigger picture or a bigger overview. Um, and they'll actually give more details also. Um, the U.S. press, to an extent, is a little, a little gun-shy. Um, because access is always an important thing. Of course, I'm talking about this in hindsight. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I was able to listen and, and hear some of the things. The other things that we were getting that I, I, I don't remember the contents of these, 
that we were getting for the first couple of weeks, we were seeing bomb damage assessment um, come across the circuit. Oh, okay. So we were reading what weapons were doing. Yeah. You know, we were reading and, and seeing what devastation this stuff had. Um, what I didn't see until later was uh, the, the turkey shoots sometimes as aircraft were um, coming in and hitting their targets um, at pretty close range. Yeah. Um, and I didn't see that until I saw CNN stuff of the war later on, you know, years later. Um, so was that that, I guess it's Highway 1 going in Kuwait north to, to um, uh, Basra was like a death trap. You know, and I never saw that. Yeah. So, but, you know. How was the morale at the time on your ship? Morale was all right. Morale was, <coughs> we'd already been in the Gulf for, uh, keep in mind, I'm I'm little guy. I'm little guy on the totem pole here, right? I'm, I'm E3 at this time. I'm a, I'm a, <laughs> I'm a seaman, right? Yeah. So, but, so I didn't necessarily have touch with a lot of the bigger stuff, but morale at the time, from my understanding, we've been in the Gulf since October 30th. So November, December, January rolls around. Now we're in a, in a hot war. God knows when it's going to happen, and we're, we're stuck until it's over. Um, so morale is both high and low. Mm -hmm. It's like, okay, let's go get them so we can get this over with and go home. Okay. Um, so morale was, you know, porpoise a little bit. Yeah. Um, morale actually was helped a little on, or for the Super Bowl, we actually gave live updates. So, um, so I was on watch, excuse me, listening to um, AFRTS, listening to the Super Bowl, and so we'd call up to combat. And, yeah. and while they were directing strike packages um, into, into, ba you know, into Baghdad and Basra yeah. and to Crete and to wherever the hell else they were going, um, I would call up and, say, and call up to the tactical action officer and say, "Tax says um, we have indications that the Giants just scored." You know? <laughs> so <laughs> keep a little balance. Huh? Absolutely. I mean, because at the same time, this is a really important. You know, yeah. home is important. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And especially looking back on it now, with the knowledge I have now, um, it was terribly important. Mm -hmm. So as minor as that might have been, and, and, and yeah. silly as it was, no. we have indications that the, that the Giants just scored the winning, <laughs> winning field goal, you know. Um, and the Bills go down again, blah, blah, blah. But, yeah. you know, but it was really important you know, yeah. to the guys upstairs to yeah. listen to this while they were sending right. in pilots into harm's way, huh. you know. Um, I remember, uh, I remember, oh my God, I can't, I can't remember the pilot's call sign. Um, but it was one of the first Tomcats that, that we lost. And the operations specialist um, was an acquaintance of mine uh, who was guiding the strike packages uh, from, from off the carrier deck to the next uh, point of control to the AWACS and then back. And so he would check them in um, as they came back and kind of check them off. And he was missing one. And he was really distraught. Yeah. Um, because he'd talked to this guy several times on the radio. Mm. Um, and so, you know, looking back, on, again, looking back on it now, you know, it was, uh, you know, knowing what he was going through yeah. was just horrific. It was just horrible. And he, he could, he had a really hard time that day and, and subsequent days. Mm. You know, um, I, I got to say, I'm, I'm kind of lucky that I didn't have to deal with that. Yeah. But, you know, being present for him then and just being, being there. He needed um, the support. I'm sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I couldn't imagine what, what was going through his mind because, you know, we, we lost the pilot. Yeah. We lost two men, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. so. I'll continue on with your, your experience. So we finished, the air war keeps going, um, and about two weeks out, on January 31st, yeah, January 31st, we find out well, actually, a couple of things happened that day. Um, I get off watch at, and I was on midnight to noon, six to six, I can't remember. Um, I get off watch and it's really early, I think I got off watch at, at zero six, and then um, we was just sitting in the birthing compartment, hanging out, watching a movie or something, and on the 1MC I hear called, 
Um, first of all, I hear the ship, or I feel the ship shudder and then back up. Now, the birthing compartment I'm in is two decks below the waterline all the way forward. And I have no idea what the hell's going on. And the, the boatswain mate of the watch calls away. There, there's a, a mine that was spotted about 100 yards from the, from the um, forecastle of the ship. And I'm sitting there thinking, <coughs> I'm like, okay, this is cool. <laughs> Let me get the hell out of where I am yeah. <laughs> and get up on the, on the O3 level on the weather deck so I can at least, A, see what's going on. Um, and then, you know, not be as much in danger. Um, so I got up in the O3 level, and sure enough, there's this, and the mine was probably about yay large, maybe a little bit large, probably a little bit larger. And we had an EOD on board to detonate mines that we found. It was, a, it was a moored contact mine that had broken off of its mooring. So this is a perfect example yes. of the potential dangers to shipping. Um, and this is, this is 17 days before the Tripoli um, was hit by a mine. Um, so, was it 17 days? Somewhere around there. Anyway, um, anyway, so we had EOD on board to, to take care of this problem. Um, so they load the helicopter up, the guys go out um, and drop into the water, and we had backed away from the mine and we moved to about three to four miles, so we're about seven, 8,000 yards away from the mine. Um, they set C4, picked up the divers, and moved away to, to detonate and, and wait for the, the weapon to detonate. And this 1,000-pound warhead goes off. So here's the 200-foot column of smoke and seawater. And about three and a half seconds later, you feel this mm -hmm. and, and a, an air pressure thud. Yeah. I'm sitting there thinking, I really like that boatswain made of the watch right now because he, he spotted this mine and saved our ass. Yeah. Um, because this is, the, this is around the time if you remember, and I don't know why, I, I hadn't even thought about this um, for a long time, but this is when the Princeton, was it the Princeton? The Princeton and the Tripoli. Yeah. Um, the Princeton, there was a moored contact mine that it rode over and detonated underneath the ship. And so the ship popped up and down and injured a couple of guys. Um, and luckily, the keel didn't crack. Then the Tripoli, hit a contact mine and blew a, da a big damn hole in it. Um, and uh, so this is just before that happened. Um, so yeah, when, when that happened, I heard about those, those two ships. I yeah. was pretty thankful. Um, and a lot of the, I mean, let's just say his back was red from all the yeah. guys patting him on the back for that one. Were things a lot more tense after that when you realized there were mines out there that? Yes and no. Um, I remember I remember during the war um, listening to um, one of the birds. So we had a, um, a, a net we called Purple um, that we had connection to a couple of the electronic warfare and uh, communications type of birds. And one of them was calling for, um, or someone pointed out that there was a specific track that was headed for uh, um, one of the battleships or something like that. Um, that turned out to be nothing. Um, but there was, you know, there was a little bit of tenseness, but, but not as much because as the days and weeks kind of trampled on, we realized that, and especially we, I, I knew that a lot of the Iraqi Air Force was not really the Iraqi Air Force anymore. It became the Iranian Air Force. Um, and so there was a, a lot of their ability to reach out and touch us has gone, had gone away. Um, so as the days kind of went on, um, worries kind of lowered just a little bit and the want to, okay, let's get this crap over with already yeah. and let's go home, um, kind, of, kind of kept going. Mm -hmm. the, the other interesting thing that happened on January 31st is we shot 15 more missiles. Oh, um, oh no, we... 15. Seven more missiles. I can't remember which. Yeah. Anyway, so we, we shot a bunch more missiles. Um, so, and this time it was during the day, which was kind of kind of neat because yeah. we weren't at general quarters, and as long as we cleared the fantail in the after area of the ship, we sat there on the weather decks and watched huh. the missiles fly off. So it was really interesting to watch how the how the weapon worked because it's, it's really cool, interesting. Now, what was the range? About how far were you from the target? 
So I don't know the targets actually. Um, my guess, I always tell people, yeah, I don't like being 600 yards from my target. I'd rather be 600 miles. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm guessing somewhere around there. It could be a little bit more. <coughs> um, so I'm just trying to think. So we were. Hang on, give me just a minute. Let me let me see if I can estimate this. So Baghdad's what at about 33 north, 33 and a half north, and we were at about 28 and a half. So that's about 300 plus miles. Okay. So nautical yeah. miles. Yeah. You know, 300, 400 miles or something like that. All right. <clears throat> Did you get after action reports on what type of damage was done? You know, I, we didn't see exactly what happened with the missiles that we shot. And I didn't find out until later. We had one of the guys from, um, from my parent command from NSGD Subic was actually in, in Riyadh. And so he was seeing all this stuff. Huh. So when we got back to PI, when we got back to the Philippines, I was like, hey, Dave, what'd we hit? Yeah. <laughs> um, and he's like, yeah, you hit everything, man. You guys, yeah. you guys nailed it, whatever. You know, they're, they're, they're satellite-guided weapons. Of course we're going to hit the damn stuff. <laughs> <laughs> but know? that was, in a way, satisfying to at least know that you had accomplished your mission. I, I think so. Yeah, I think so. Um, I think so. I, I think, I think it really. I mean, looking back on it now, I, th I think it was an unfortunate war, and I think I don't know. I mean, warfare is necessary, but it's it's just a horrible way to deal with things. Yeah. You know, I mean. Uh, I'm, I'm a weird guy because I'm a Democrat, but but I'm a pro-military person. Yeah. I'm a. It's just. I don't know. War, warfare is awful. Yeah. Because I, I see every day working with my clients now, I see every day what warfare does, and how horrible it is. You know, and it's just. And what guys, you know, what stays with people for years and years and years, even if they're doing the righteous thing. It still doesn't get out of the warrior's mind, does it? No, not at all. No. And and granted, there are people who can live with it, but they still may churn just a little bit. Yeah, yeah. You know, and it's just, I, I don't know, I, I, I wish more people knew the yeah. depths of um, how serious warfare is on the warrior. It's but Pretty hard to know, I guess, unless you've served and been through it. It, it, yeah, it is. And like I said, and my military combat experience was minimal. I mean, it was go out, sit out at sea. Thankfully, someone saw mine. We didn't get hit. Nothing hit us. Nothing came out after us. We lucked out. Um, so, I mean, it, it, what was really interesting was when the generals in Riyadh, and they, they decided to launch the ground war and get started and move everybody out of Kuwait. Um, it was over so quickly yeah. that it's like, oh, great, we can go home now. Yeah. Sweet. <laughs> See ya. <Yeah. laughs> you know? Um, and that happened, what was that? Was that April 1st? No, 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 February 28th. Um, was it that? Yeah, it was the 17th to the 24th, and the 24th to the 28th was the, was the um, end of the ground war. For, you know the, the hundred hours, yeah. um, so that was kind of that was kind of really nice. Yeah. It was really nice, and and what's really funny is looking back on it, um, a, f a guy I met later on while I was in college, um, at a uh, collegiate photog or photojournalism competition, was a ground pounder, um, doing telemetry interception on the ground. In Kuwait. Or while, in, you, while you were in Saudi doing Arabia. what you were doing, mm -hmm. huh. and huh. so that was kind of kind yeah. of interesting. Um, if he ever comes down to Atlanta, I gotta send yeah, you send him your way. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, it was just it's interesting to swap stories with with different people yeah. And, yeah. and talk about that. But that was I mean that was that and pulling into Jabal Ali in the middle of the war to refit, put on you know take on more weapons and and hang out for a couple of days. That was about it. Excuse when me. you say hang out for a couple of days, did, did you ever have any contact with the locals in any of the places you were in the Middle East? Oh, yeah. Um, so 
we got, like I said, we got there October 30th, and we pulled into Bahrain, we pulled into um, um, Abu Dhabi, and I think pulled into Dubai as well. Um, and then this, in, from February 16th-ish to, for about four or five days, we were in Jebel Ali, which we weren't allowed to leave the port facility. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, we had, we, you know, spent time, went out in town, and on the two other deployments, I went to the Middle East, to, to the Persian Gulf. Um, the second one was in uh, 1992. Um, that was on the USS Valley Forge, uh, which I'm really sad is now at the bottom of an ocean now. It was used as a target. Um, and the USS Shiloh in 94. Okay. And so we pulled in several places and definitely had a lot of interactions with uh, folks there. I think it's always interesting to people to find out during a conflict what the attitude of the local people were towards soldiers and sailors when they were on shore or in town. And did mm -hmm. you, anything significant that you saw or felt or conversations you had with them that, that, that you wanted to talk about? Not necessarily. I, one thing, while we were there, in, in, when I was there in 1990, because we pulled in before the war started, we didn't, I didn't get out in town somewhere afterwards. Um, so we pulled in before the war started, and the folks were pretty much used to the, what is now the, the U.S. Fifth Fleet being there and pulling in there all the time, um, into Bahrain or into um, the UAE. Um, and they were comfortable with it. Um, and they didn't even bat an eye at, at us. They, they, most people treated us pretty fairly, actually, yeah, yeah. Um, and were really kind. There was, there was one decision that I made. Um, so a buddy of mine, who I think is still in the Navy, um, and I, in 94, we got into a cab um, in Dubai, in Abu Dhabi, excuse me, and said, okay, we want to go eat some local food, take us somewhere cool, excuse me, um, take us somewhere neat. And, of course, now, nowadays, you never do that because God knows where the guy's going to take yeah, you. Yeah. You know, you'll end up kidnapped and, and uh, you know, bag over your head. Yeah. Um, but this guy took us to his cousin's restaurant. And we ate for, for 10 U.S. dollars a piece. We, we walked out of there stuffed. Okay. And they treated us great. And where was this? This was in Abu Dhabi. Abu Dhabi, okay. And in the UAE. And they were, yeah. they were wonderful folks. Huh. You know? It, we wouldn't bat an eye. I mean, actually, if I went back there today, I'd probably do the same thing. Yeah. And, and it was, it, yeah, I, I, I didn't have a, have a problem while I was over there. I think a more interesting time for me was when, um, so when I was in Iraq in 2003, um, as journalist, um, that was a little more interesting because, you, you know, it was, okay, so who do you trust? So I was, um, night, then Knight Ritter um, had about 40 of us um, r reporters and, and photographers trained us up and were gonna send us into certain places. And I was supposed to embed with the 1st Armored Division, of course, but I, I actually beat them to Iraq. Um, so I spent a few weeks in Najaf and a few weeks in Baghdad. Um, so only about six weeks in the beginning of, 2000, in the, beginning of the war. Well, that's interesting you know, three, because that's a whole different experience. It's a completely different experience. So, I'd be interested to hear you continue to talk about your military experience and what you saw and what you did, and then transition over to what you did mm -hmm. as a reporter, because I okay. think that would be a, so, a, a, a good story to hear. Sure. So um, in between, so first, in, first deployment, um, got back to the Philippines, and there's another part of the thing that's going to, that's, so <laughs> I get deployed, go to war for the first time, and then in June of, 2000, of 1991, Mount Pinatubo explodes. So I got to be a part of, the <laughs> of a volcanic er eruption. There's volcanoes, <laughs> or the volcano. Um, of course, earthquakes go along with the volcano, plus a typhoon that was actually uh, brushing <laughs> the Philippines at the same time <laughs> and blowing all of the stuff. <coughs> Um, from Pinatubo, which is right near Clark Air Base, right down to um, uh, Subic Bay. Good God. Um, so lived through that, dug some ash out for a month and a half, et cetera. Um, luckily, luckily, very few people uh, were injured on, po uh, on the base, and um, there were a lot of people that were, of course, 
uh, I mean, I'm laughing about it. There were a lot of people that were injured or, yeah. um, and lost their lives in local communities and whatnot. Um, but it was, I mean, what an experience. You know, we, we ended up driving from Subic to Clark to help clean out the spaces up there because it's a cryptologic space, oh. a joint cryptologic space. Yeah. Um, and so we we went there to help clean it out. They'd already done emergency destruction. We'd actually already done emergency destruction um, on whatever information we had, just to be sure. Mm -hmm. And um, which was interesting because no one ever does that. Um, now how did you handle it? How did you destroy it? Oh, burn barrels. Okay. <laughs> just the same, the old basic <laughs> kerosene and a big and a big fifty-five gallon drum. We just started throwing stuff in there, just like they did fifty years ago. Yeah, ex absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And it, it wasn't it wasn't the best, um, uh, the the most um, I guess r regulations way to do it, <laughs> but it was effective. Yeah. <laughs> we burn all kinds of stuff, um, but we. A small group of us got in a couple of vans, and I couldn't believe, as far as I understand, we did this. I couldn't believe we did this unarmed. Um, we got into a couple of vans and drove from Subic Bay to Clark Air Base through NPA territory, oh. through, at times, like knee deep water, um, because there are lahar and mud flows and, yeah. and, and flooding and all that stuff, um, up to Clark. <laughs> and then back the next day, oh, and and I can't, I could still couldn't believe we did this on armed. Um, but anyway, so uh, so Subic then that ended of course after the Philippines closed all their stuff. Um, my second command was um, Naval Security Group activity Kenia, Hawaii. So um, it's literally next door to Schofield Barracks. Um, if you've never been to Hawaii, um, Schofield is. So on Kenia Road, there's Wheeler Army Airfield, which was one of the targets during um, Pearl Harbor. Um, and then Schofield is just to the west of that, and just to the south of Schofield is Kenia Field Station. And this little underground, wonderful little cryptologic wonderland. Huh. Um, it was originally built to uh, build uh, aircraft during World War II. Oh. So they stripped away the land, built a building, and then covered it up. Um, so it was it was kind of fun to be there. It was a really neat piece of history. Now, what did you do in that assignment? S sa actually, same job. Um, yeah. Got there. I was in the direct support shop again. So I got to Hawaii in June of '92. Yeah, June of '92, and then five weeks later, I was out at sea. Um, where my first or second day in the division, I said, "If you got something, you know, give me the first thing smoking." So I said, if you got a small boy, I'll take that. Because I, want, I didn't want to be on a carrier because it's just too many people. Yeah. So got on another guided missile cruiser on the Valley Forge, went back to the Gulf. Um, we, they flew us to San Diego, did the Great Circle route, um, hit Japan, Korea, went through a typhoon, um, and ended up going out to the Gulf um, again and sitting out there, wow. cutting water donuts, <laughs> doing close to nothing. Uh, listening to who we were listening to, and this time, this time was a little more interesting. <coughs> one of the fire control chiefs, um, and I can't remember his name, but one of the fire control chiefs uh, used to be in SEAL teams, and he had decided to leave the teams and go back and work in this rate. Well, while he's there, of course, we're, part of the mission for Valley Forge was um, monitoring, because it's an air warfare platform, is to monitor and control air but also um, to do interdiction on uh, tankers um, to and from Iraq or to and from places because they're still in an oil embargo, right? Because Hussein's still in power. The coup in 91 failed. Um, and so we're, we're supposed to do interdictions and do boarding parties. And so this chief petty officer decided, or not decided, but was tasked with training a bunch of guys to go do boardings. Um, and looking back on it now, man, that would have been fun to yeah. do, to learn something from this guy. Because yeah. on top of which, he was a really fantastic man. Um, he was a really great dude. But um, yeah, it was, it was, so that was, my mission was the same. Put the cans on, copy yeah. code, yeah. do the stuff. I, instead of, um, instead of weeding, or instead of uh, just sitting there and, and um, copying, I actually 
now I'm the more senior, I'm a senior third class, even though you know, I'm still an E4. Um, but now I'm teaching the guys that I'm taking out to see. Now I'm the, I'm the more, more of the expert. And at the same time, the second time I went, or when I went back to the golf two years later, um, as a second class, um, again, I'm, I'm writing the coverage plans for um, our ship. We had two independent steamers for our ship and the other ship. Um, I'm writing the, um, coordinating the coverage of uh, any potential adversaries during transit and while we're in the Gulf. So I'm employing all the stuff yeah. that I've learned in the past, and, yeah. and so now it's getting a little more fun. Okay. Um, in between, the fun part, in between Valley Forge and Shiloh, um, I got a chance to ride three submarines. Now that must have been a quite of an experience. It, it was. It was. It was a. It was a hoot, um, to put it mildly. The really cool part about and now, so now this is the part where my recruiter pointed out about being a spook, um, because that's what they we were referred to. Oh, the spooks are on board, yeah. right? Um, the cool part about riding submarines is we were the mission. When you when you get a detachment of cryptologists on that, you're the mission. You're, we're the whole mission. We're it. Go somewhere and collect. And it was a blast. It really was. Um, I, I wish I could tell you where they were. Yeah. Um, but they were, uh, you know, between 92, or I'm sorry, between 93 and um, early 94, I rode three submarines and okay. um, went to a couple places that were... Uh, uh, pretty important to um, national security at the time, and it was it yeah. was a good time. And I assume, without divulging any information you shouldn't divulge, but mm -hmm. I'm <coughs> assuming that the information you picked up in a submarine would typically be more critical than your prior well, assignment, just because you could get closer and hear more communications is that true yeah I, th I think that's the case and and it really depended also on on what the particular mission was so one of the missions was was collection another mission was um, kind of like um, watch and see what's happening um, and just be a little closer so you can hear so yeah. Uh, yeah it was it was a little more I don't know yeah I guess it was it was a little more touchy-feely so to speak mm -hmm. Um, where, you know, I mean, we would get close enough to generally smell the folks and mm -hmm, yeah. they wouldn't know we were there. And that was kind of the fun part, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, again, that was, that was the fun part because it, we got to literally do the job and we were the whole reason. I mean, we, we positioned the boat pretty much. So we, I mean, not that, not saying that we would um, command the, the, the CO of the boat, but, right. but it's, you know, you know, can we have a couple feet of, of scope? You know, yeah. do you mind raising the boat up to it? Oh, yeah. So it's like, you know, and that's a potential danger when, yeah. of course, when you're getting closer to the surface, the scope is is the, the antenna. So, <clears throat> you know, that's, it, it's, I don't know, it's just, it was fun. I mean, I hate to put it in such bland terms. Yeah. Well, now, when you were gathering this information, was it voice or data? I mean, were they speaking and you could actually hear what they were saying? Well, let me answer that question in, in by answering it but not answering okay. it. I'll just say I was paid to listen to the radio. And okay. also remember that um, my my specific job, um, I was a Morse interceptor okay. um, and Morse analyst. So that was really more okay. of what okay. um, my job was. God knows who, who, who uses Morse anymore, but... Because you know, I was wondering with the language, mm -hmm. did, did you have to have language training? Or? It really depends on the country. Um, there are many, there are many places in the world um, that use English. Yeah. Um, so, you know, and there are many places in the world that um, use only specific language when they're communicating. Mm -hmm. So, you, you know, once you get a hold of that language, yeah. you can yeah. kind of figure it out. Mm -hmm. um, another thing that's really interesting is that you know something's happening when specific things when and when excuse me when when voice inflection changes when um, voices get higher and hotter and louder um, or if they're covered up like uh, when we were in the Gulf the first time uh, USS Slade Gulf um, had a false reading of their nuclear or biological weapons 
and they were on the circuit with us. And you can hear a tank like this because they're, they're talking through gas masks. Oh, and it's like, so, yeah. so it's really important some of the information you get is not the actual communications, yeah. Yeah. right? So sitting in the newsroom listening while I was a working journalist listening to um, uh, police and fire radios, if they're talking like we're talking now, nothing's happening. If they're talking through masks and they're saying, get in here, you know, like, yeah. Yeah. Is it, 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 okay, so now we need to roll out to this fire because there's probably flames 50 feet high, yeah. right? So that's kind of what I brought with me right. um, okay. from the other job. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, so submarines was a good time. Huh. Best food, and, and I tell you, the smartest people. <laughs> really? the, that was one of the best parts about being on boats was that the, the, the guys on, the men on the submarines, and now, now women as well, were the smartest of the smart. Really? Absolutely. Um, and they all wanted to be there. So that was, that was really That's nice. critical. Mm -hmm. They want to be there. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, it was a good time. Hmm. <laughs> well, and you were you wanted to be there, and you were smart too. So you were part of the I hope so part of the team. <laughs> <laughs> okay, where did you go after that? Um, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, so after three submarines, then I rode um, USS Shiloh um, out to the Persian Gulf for my last deployment. Um, got off of that at the end of '94. Something like that, um, and then um, and in June of '94, I, or I decided to apply for colleges and um, got out of the Navy in June of '95, or actually left and was on terminal leave for a um, month and a half or two months, okay. um, and then went to uh, Florida State University and transferred to the University of Florida, where I got a journalism degree. Okay. Um, Before we move on, sure. What did you weigh in your decision to leave the military? Um, or to make it just you know, simpler, why, why did you get in as opposed to stay, get, get out as opposed to stay in? Well, as I had, at, the, at that time I was about five and a half to six years. Mm -hmm. And if I was going to take another tour somewhere, it would, be, it would be on the beach somewhere. So sure, it wouldn't be as exciting or, or whatever, or I wouldn't be traveling. Um, but at, after three more years somewhere, because it would be in the U.S., um, I'd be at the nine-year, nine-and-a-half-year mark. And if I'm going to be in for that long, I'm going to be in for 20 years. Yeah. So <clears throat> it was either get out now and then find something to move on to or stay in and retire. Okay. And don't get me wrong, I'm, every time I look back on it, with the exception of meeting and marrying my wife, um, and of course some of the really great things that I did as a journalist, um, I, looking back on it now, I would have stayed in, yeah. um, and I would have done a lot of things differently. I would have gotten some more. I would have gotten warfare pins. I would have um, volunteered for more things. I would have done uh, things a little differently. Yeah. Um, but uh, but yeah, that's really what weighed. It was like okay, so either stay in and stay in, right. be a lifer, or which there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, there's a lot sure. of fantastic folks yeah. Yeah. Um, who stayed in and made a great career, yeah. um, or get out and move on. Well, it sounds like you had some fascinating experiences after you got out of the military. Talk about your, <laughs> your journalism assignments and what you did. I apologize. <clears throat> On camera. Let's talk about what you did after you got out of the military. You went to school mm -hmm. and then you went into a, a, a journalism profession, it sounds like. Is that yeah. correct? So, so when I was at FSU, um, so I went to Florida State University when I first got out, which I, I've got to tell you, one of the best things that I did after I got out was when leaving Hawaii, picking up my car in New Orleans and driving in a straight line for more than two hours was fantastic. <laughs> um, anyway, so um, after a semester of being I at Florida State, I, I don't know, I bought a camera or something like that. I had a couple of bucks for, you know, some disposable income. And my roommate at the time said, hey, you know, look, they're, they're looking for photographers at the, at the student newspaper. Why don't you go check it out? And I'm like, okay, sure, why not? So um, I went over there, met the guy that was the um, student photo editor, and started shooting some assignments and shooting some sports. And I was like, you know, this is kind of fun. 
let's see if I can make some money, uh, not make some money at it, but let's, let me go buy some cameras and stuff and yeah. let's start getting into this. Yeah. Um, and I was doing okay in my, in my classes. It was a business management or something like that or information systems or whatever yeah. flavor it was that year uh, or that semester. And um, I said, no, you know, something, I, I think this journalism thing is going to be where I'm going to go. So decided to, I finished it. So now knowing um, that f the Florida State University system required, or said, if you finish an AA somewhere, you can go anywhere you want. So I, I applied for the AA at Florida State. So I knew I was guaranteed to go to UF and transferred because there's journalism is there. Um, and there it was. Um, so I started hanging out with all the photographers in the journalism school, started working at the Gainesville Sun, um, did some freelance work for a couple of other newspapers, um, did internships in uh, Topeka, Kansas and Flint, Michigan and um, St. Louis and and it, you know I, I got bit. <clears throat> um, so yeah, so then when I graduated from uh, UF in 99, um, got a uh, got an offer from the state newspaper in Columbia, South Carolina. Um, also got an offer from the Tampa Tribune and I decided to go to Columbia because it was a better paper, um, better photo play, better opportunity in uh, the chain itself. Um, so then the chain that the state was owned by was Knight Ritter, um, which I'm not sure you're familiar with. But <coughs> So Knight Ritter newspapers. Yeah. Um, <coughs> As time started passing, of course, now we're starting to get into, you know, presidents elected, mm -hmm. September 11th happens. The next thing you know, we're starting to talk about this potential weapons of mass destruction. Mm -hmm. And the folks at Knight Ritter, Washington, wanted to get way ahead of it because they just, for some reason, they saw the, the writing on the wall. Let's get in front of it, um, <coughs> start training our folks, um, and get ready to go. <clears throat> and of course, you know, put me on the first thing smoking. You know, <laughs> you think back to 92, it's like, okay, yeah, yeah. <laughs> send me. Um, so, of course, you know, it, it scared the crap out of me. So the first, the first, um, we get to, so I, I finally get to, or I guess I get flown to Germany because I thought first armored was going and first infantry got dropped into um, northern Iraq and anyway, me messed that up. I ended up covering... The first couple of, uh, the first two sets of wounded guys to be interviewed at Launchstuhl, um, I was sitting in the front row wow. um, covering that. Some really good, good warriors, uh, some really good soldiers and Marines that, that um, uh, decided to talk to the journalists. Um, and that was, that was really fun. Again, that touched, that touched something really close to me, yeah. something important to me. Yeah. Because, you know, again, having, been in Iraq, or I'm sorry, having been in the Gulf, not necessarily seeing it. Now I'm seeing these guys with physical injuries. Yeah. And, and of course, at that time, knowing what I know now, nothing is registering. It's all new. It's all so quickly. They're, they're in, they're hit, they're out, right? And so there's a lot of other things that may, that may follow for them yeah. or may have followed for them. But it was really great being on, uh, on, a, on an Army base. It was really great being um, around. And I, was, I actually was on a tarmac when... Um, Jessica Lynch was uh, flown into Germany, oh. Oh. so that was you know I mean, yeah. just but I mean you know I'm God knows how far away from the airplane, but you know there I am. Um, so anyway, um, I actually went back to the U.S. for a couple of weeks, and then um, my editor in Washington said, "Okay, well you know, go meet so and so in Amman, and you're going to get on, you're going to go drive uh, to Najaf for for a little while." So I'm like, "Okay." So our first work day was the 39th day of Ashura. We, we got to Najaf. Um, a reporter was already there, and I was paired with another reporter. Pardon me. Um, I was paired with another reporter, in, um, and we rode in a 14-hour car ride from Amman, Jordan, and um, drove up to Karbala during this whole uh, Ashura festival, which is the celebrating... Um, uh, Hussein's, not Saddam Hussein, but cel celebrating um, Hussein's assassination actually mm -hmm. in 600 or something AD or something, 660 yeah. AD. Um, and it was just wild. No one wanted to do anything horrible. We were, 
some of, some of the, you know, like, there were only a handful of journalists there. Um, but it was just, holy crap, this is, it's really happening because all, these people from all over Iraq and Iran, and they're all coming through in towns full or tribes full or whatever, and entering the mosque or entering the, the shrine and paying their respects during this festival. It's like the, it's the biggest day in, you know, in the calendar for them. Um, and it was really, really neat to be there. But it was scary. It, it, you know, we, we pulled up to the outer part of, of Karbala, and here's this dude standing there with an AK, going, okay, come on in. I'm like, okay. <laughs> Interesting. Hey, I assume <coughs> you were not able to go into the mosque. They wouldn't allow you to go in there? No. Um, actually, a friend of mine did, yeah. um, and he looked a hell of a lot more Arab than I did. Yeah. Um, but he did. He took. He was a little more of a risk taker, um, uh, and he's a pretty damn good photographer. He's a really, really good journalist. Um, but this was his his first uh, yeah. foray into conflict as well, and he'd already been in a couple of places and a couple of skirmishes with um, while he was embedded before he left the embed. Okay. Um, but no, I I never went into the shrine and crawled in with with um, whomever was crawling or or whatnot. Yeah. Was it a fairly solemn group? The people that were Going oh, it was to the shrine party. and coming out, or was it? It was it was both a party and solemn and and a cel. I mean, the celebration was. This is the first time since since Hussein took power that they had been able to do this. Oh, so that's oh. why it was so festive. Oh, okay. but it was so important. So a lot of there were there was one group um, that was documented by a couple of photographers um, that actually were um, cutting themselves to cause physical pain because. They're expressing the the religious beliefs for yeah. uh, Hussein and the assassination and, and uh, in support of whatever. Yeah, wow. So it was just, it's it's hard to describe without seeing photographs of this, but yeah. it's just, it was crazy. I mean, Cra very few Westerners, <clears throat> at least at that time, have ever experienced that. Yeah, huh? very few. Um, and our fixer and driver, that even though they weren't very religious, they were like, yeah, there's there's our town, you know, there's the group from our town, and there's the group from... Gosh. From the Joff, and there's the group from so and so, and I'm like, holy crap, this is really neat. Wow. Yeah, it was it was a really neat piece of history to be in, to be to be to be present for. You know, I, the only thing I wish is that my photographs actually <laughs> were good enough to show how actually amazing it was. I mean, they were decent, but you know. Well, that's what I wanted to ask you. Did you get a lot of good photos out of? <coughs> Excuse me. Um, I think so. <laughs> I, I think I was a little scared shitless. <laughs> <laughs> I can understand that. <laughs> um, so you know, it was it was really my first experience being or doing something internationally and uh, you know, covering something internationally. Yeah. It was just like okay then, wow. you know. <clears throat> I mean, while I, while I was in Germany for a couple of weeks um, after this, um, I got sent to the wrong unit thing. Um, I went up to Berlin, covered a protest, went down to Launchstuhl, but that is nothing compared to yeah. what I experienced in, in Karbala that day. Oh. Um, and then it just progressed from, so then we started covering um, aftermath of assassinations in Najaf from warring factions, like shortly after the war started. Then we started covering um, uh, aftermath of civilian population uh, injuries. Um, one 15-year-old girl we covered, um, Zahra, I can't remember her last name, her family's name, but she was I mean, this beautiful young girl, and just the left side of her body was just, was just shredded by, by some sort of um, cluster weapon or something like that, yeah. that landed about 100, 100 meters from her home. And it was just, you know, she lost a parent or two, I think she lost a parent, she lost a brother. Um, and she was just the sweetest girl, you know. Um, <clears throat> that was one of the, one of the, I mean, we, we, I mean, we spent most of the day with them um, in the hospital and then went down where she had to have dressings changed and I asked to photograph um, her, her having her dressings changed and she was like, you know, I mean, she it was really painful stuff. Um, so, I mean, it was, it was it was hard to be there and watch, but it was important to document, yeah. you know. That had to be emotional for you. Yeah, it, it was really funny. She was asking for water, and no one had water except for me. I had a camelback on. Huh. <laughs> so, so I was like, 
here's what you do. <laughs> and, and like no English, yeah. because or, or she speaks no English, I speak no Arabic. Yeah. Um, and so I, I, I was like, bite and, and suck, here. <laughs> and you know, I asked her uncle, I was like, can I do this? He said, do you mind? He says, oh, go ahead. So, um, you know, she's laying on an operating table. I'm about to photograph her going through excruciating pain. <laughs> and here we are, sharing water. Boy. You know, and I mean, that was, I mean, looking back on it, that was one of the, one of the nice things, I think, yeah. that was really crappy and enjoyable to do yeah. at the same time, you know. Boy. So, I mean, I won't, I won't forget her. Um, more aftermath, we, we covered... Um, uh, the same friend of mine was, uh, and a couple of other journalists had been over to, um, in the Jaff is actually the largest cemetery in the world. Um, so large, in fact, you can see it from space. Um, and there is a tomb uh, for Adam. Adam, like the first man, the Adam. right? Um, in the Jaff. <clears throat> Jaffa? The Jaff, N A J A F, yeah. And um, so I went over to. Uh, a Washington Post photographer had, had made um, a short picture story of a family that had been uh, killed during bombardment, like 10 family members or something like that. Um, and he, he made a really fantastic picture story like the day before I'd gotten there. Um, so we went to the, the uh, where they washed the ceremonially washed the bodies and found um, a family from Nasiriya who had been looking and looking for their um, family member who was in the Air Force or was in, a, in the military, who was killed during bombardment. And they finally found him at some morgue in Baghdad. Um, and a very rare occurrence, his brother um, washed his, his body, the deceased, the student's body. Um, and they were kind enough to let me photograph that Gosh. and the funeral and going to the grave site and stuff like that. Um, and so that's something, again, you know, this happened 13 years ago, so, you know, it's something I won't forget either, because they were, they were, I mean, here, here is an American journalist coming to photograph what happened from American bombardment. Boy. And, you know, and they're from Nasiriya, if you remember. Yeah. This is where the 507th got ambushed, yeah. right? And this is where a lot of um, hard Marine fighting happened, or hard fighting that Marines did, and lost a lot of folks. Um, so this family from this, from this town to allow me to be present was really, it was um, it was a treat, you know. I mean, that, I, mean I, I use that word, but it was uh, an experience. It was a gift, actually. Then they obviously trusted you. They didn't at first, and then they got to. Um, and then when we when we said our farewells, um, they were like, "So when you come to Nasiriya, you're going to stay with us, right?" I'm like, "Well, I'm not sure I'm going to be there, but you know, I've got your number now." <laughs> yeah. But um, yeah, they were they were really kind. Well, now, what's interesting, <clears throat> not to get into a political discussion, but, it, I mean, it's encouraging in a way, but mm -hmm. you said you're Jewish. You always hear about the anti-Jewish feelings of the Muslims, and here it, is you being welcomed with open arms. Now, they may not have known you were Jewish. Oh, they didn't. No, no, no. No, <laughs> no, no, no. So, um, just jokingly, this is only after a few days of being in the Jaff, uh, one of, we had two drivers, two fixers. Um, so fixer being uh, a translator or yeah. someone who, if you say, and the reason why they call them fixers is, hey, we want to do this, go fix it, yeah. right? <laughs> <clears throat> um, and so one of the drivers, um, Baha, was, and he spoke English pretty damn well, who actually, he says, he was actually a policeman in the Republican Guard. <laughs> <Really? Holy laughs> <God. laughs> um, and then just like took his uniform off and walked away. Um, anyway, so so he spoke English pretty well. And this other um, this fixture that I used um, for a while, this guy. Um, why am I blanking on his name? I still keep in touch with him. I'm actually friends with him on Facebook. Um, we were driving to this to this one house, actually Baha's family's house, and. Um, the reporter that I was working with asks him, so what's what's worse, being Jewish or, or being atheist? And he goes, being Jewish. <laughs> and I'm like, sweet. <laughs> um, you know, but, you know, we, we were laughing. We went to go cover, are you familiar with the name Muqtada al-Sadr? Yes, yes. So in, 
in April, April or very early May, it's like end of April in in '03, we went to the um, the Kufa Mosque. Kufa is about two and a half kilometers away from Najaf. We went to the Kufa Mosque to listen to Al Sadr talk. Um, so it was the first sermon, the first time he was going to talk in public to a large Friday afternoon prayer. And I walk in there, um, take off my boots. Um, I sit down and I'm waiting for him to, to talk. First thing happens is this schmuck dressed in black comes up. One of the Mehdi army comes up and is, is like, y y you go. And I'm like, no, huh? I don't understand. No, you go. And I'm like, what? And this guy from Bo sitting next to me from Basra starts speaking English to me. And he says, who are you here with? And I said, well, I'm, I work for a newspaper company. And, and he backs me up and, he, and he's like, no, 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 everything's fine. So then he and I start talking, because he speaks pretty damn good English. And then a little while later, so you know, where are you from? How's it going? Da, da, da. So what are you, he says. So typical Southern question, right? Yeah. But what are you? And I said, what do you mean? He says, well, are you Muslim? And I'm like, well, I was born in a Lutheran hospital. Because I was born at Lutheran General in Park Ridge, right? So, and I'd already thought about how to, but of course, when he asked that question, you know, all of the moisture just sucked out of my mouth. I, yeah. I just, you know, complete cotton mouth. And I was like, okay, so you kind of keep your damn cool. Yeah. Um, so what are you? And I, and I finally said, well, you know, I'm Lutheran. So not Christian, not just Lutheran. Right. And, um, and he, some, he pressed for something else. And I said, well, you know, my parents don't, or I don't, whatever. Um, of course, while I was in Iraq and before I went, the beard was was present, and I made a point, especially south of Baghdad, to to have a beard and to continue to let yeah. it grow, yeah. um, because Shia men grew their beards, yeah. um, and if, you know a lot of people would come up and ask me if I spoke Arabic in Arabic, and of course, la Arabi, and uh, you know I don't speak it, but um, yeah, that was that was kind of a scary moment. Then yeah. Al Sadr comes on talks, I shoot my pictures, and I get the hell out of there. Yeah. Um, so after the sermon or after whatever the hell he said was over, there was 15,000 other people there. Anybody finds out that, you know, what my religion is, you know, my goose is cooked. Yeah. So, you know, see ya. Yeah. Of course, the best part is right after we left, we're in the car, we're driving, and our fixer, um, I, can't, I, can't remember his, uh, I can't remember his name either, um, Hassan or Hakim, our fixer, pull, they, he's like, oh, pull over. And they get falafel at this falafel stand. And I was like, oh, I want one too. <laughs> and it was the best falafel I've ever had. <laughs> I was like, this is great. <laughs> so, um, so here, you know, here we go, having to think my way out of, out of something. And, you know, now we're having falafel yeah. and, <laughs> and driving back. Um, yeah, so. We'll talk about, <clears throat> I guess we're, what, 1990 what now at this point? What? Oh, 2003. I mean, not 19, but 2003. Uh -huh. um, talk about what you did subsequently up to the present. Um, so since since then, you know, my, my time in journalism was, was you know, I'd, se I'd spent seven more years um, at the paper and uh, at the state. And around 2008 is when Knight Ritter, or actually McClatchy then, because uh, McClatchy had purchased the company, um, started uh, laying off folks, and a lot of journalists started yeah. getting laid off, and newspapers started shrinking, and a lot of things started happening um, in journalism that was was kind of unsavory. And in 2000, I, I'm like, okay, well, what the hell am I going to do? Um, so I decided to um, I decided to go to grad school for something. Took the GRE, not the GRE, the um, LSAT, and completely bombed it. And I'm really glad I did because I really shouldn't be a lawyer. <laughs> Um, I mean, I, I mean, I, I get it. I mean, I understand that, but not the intricacies of where I really need yeah. to. Um, and then um, I learned that uh, um, I, I had the idea, you know, it would be kind of interesting to do therapy. Um, and if I'm going to do therapy, I'm going to do therapy for veterans. Mm -hmm. And if I'm going to do therapy for veterans, I'm going to do therapy with combat veterans. Mm -hmm. um, because, you know, I didn't see much. Um, and I'm sure you've heard before, if, I, if, if someone were asked, do you want to, are you ready to go back, you know, let's go now. Mm -hmm. So this was my way, mm -hmm. and I, I attempted to get back in the Navy, and 
not as an enlisted man, um, and I got no thanks. So I said, okay, and that was about um, uh, six or so years before that. And, um, you know, I said, well, you know, let's do this. So I got in the master's social work program um, at the University of South Carolina um, in 2008. And for the last two years I was working at the paper, I was part-time in school. Um, so while I was doing that and covering all kinds of stuff from, um, I think we, you know, we covered presiden presidential visits, we covered um, not pet of the week, but you know, run of the mill stuff yeah. down the block and um, politics at the state house and all kinds of stuff. Um, but yeah, so while I was in grad school, um, I worked at Fort Jackson Army Substance Abuse Program in grad school, and then I worked in the trauma therapy, um, worked with the trauma therapist, um, working with combat exposed soldiers, uh, and that was the whole goal. That was the whole reason um, to go to grad school and switch because, you know, both good and both bad, um, my job is going to be needed for a long time. Yeah. You know. Um, so, well, that's got to be very satisfying, doing what you're doing. It, you know, it it is. It when I finished grad school, I worked in sub primary substance abuse for three years, but mostly with with um, veterans or with active duty. So I worked at, um, for the Army Substance Abuse Program um, at Fort Gordon down the road. I worked uh, at an intensive outpatient program um, on the north part of the perimeter, uh, north of town. Um, servicing VA patients, um, and then at, a, at an inpatient hospital before all of that, um, and we would take uh, the occasional soldier from Fort Benning. Um, and so they hired me specifically for my experience w with military folks. Um, but yeah, that the whole, the whole reason was to do the job I'm doing now. Um, so I work now at Shepherd Center at the Share Military Initiative um, and we work with uh, brain injured and uh, PTSD suffering mm -hmm. folks um, who have been to Iraq, Afghanistan, or points other. Uh, worked with a guy who worked on the um, African uh, Horn of Africa as well. Um, so it's you know it's it's a pain in the ass <laughs> because we veterans can be a, a, a stubborn bunch, um, but when when the, the when the curtains and the and the walls finally come down. You know, there's there's always a real caring, wonderful person under yeah. there. You know, and that's the that's the wonderful stuff is being able to see change and and, and being able to see um, folks kind of become themselves again. You know, and not haunted by some of the some of the horrific yeah. shit that they did, yeah. or that they watched, or that they experienced, or heard about, or whatever. You know. Well, it's got to be so meaningful for them that they've got another veteran working with them, mm -hmm. I would think. Yeah, and it's it's nice. So there's, there's four of us on the staff, myself, our nurse, who is a Navy corpsman, um, our physician, who is a flight physician, a flight doc in the Air Force, and one of our peer, um, uh, our uh, peer liaison, who is an uh, Army Ranger. Wow. Um, so it's nice to have that. I yeah. think more importantly, is that there's a staff full of, full of civilians who may have a veterans uh, or military tie-in somewhere, but they learn how to be civilians again. Yeah, that's okay. You know, and, yeah. and, it, and it's so important yeah. to, to learn how to deal with with yeah. with things we didn't have to deal with in the military. To learn how to get back into the culture, to learn how that individualism is okay, right? Because the whole military idea of mission first, team first, um, always look out away from ourselves and care for self last, right? And that just perpetuates. And so with seeing them learn how to do those things and care for self, not first, but at least equally mm -hmm. um, to everyone else is actually really nice. It's, it's really good, you know, it's, it's, it's tough, you know, it's listening to some of the stories is, is not fun. And I'm sure you're, familiar you know well you you've obviously succeeded in that and uh, you, you succeeded in helping them succeed so that's got to make you feel feel good it does because we we have um we have a person who does aftercare so we hear about for the oh, for a year afterward yeah. at least 
um, we'll hear stories and we'll hear, right. hey, so and so is having a little difficulty here. Here's how to tweak that, or, or so and so is having a success and everything's going great here, or everything's going for, to shit here, or yeah. whatever. So, um, yeah. you know, we we do get that, and that's one of the nice things that, because we get to hear about it. Be, yeah. And for a lot of the guys I worked with, um, I, I don't get that, yeah. you know. But uh, so I want to give you a chance to ask any questions you have. Or <coughs> This has been just fascinating. I'm just so impressed at the different perspectives that you've gotten from mm. the military experience. You've really viewed it from about every side there is to view. Well, yeah, I guess so, huh? Yeah. You know, I mean, the only thing I, th I think that I never got a chance to view it from was on the ground holding a weapon and being with some of the guys. I mean, I can, I can imagine being my, you know, ha being there, but there's, there, but that's all I can do, you know, and, and that's one of the reasons why, I, why I'm still doing what I'm doing is because, you know, I told someone this one time, I, it, and this is, the, I guess this is my, and I, I'm, I'm not saying this to pat myself on the back, but, but this is just what I need to be doing. But, uh, I don't know, penance, no, but. I don't know, didn't do enough, I, I don't know. It's your contribution. Maybe. Yeah. But, you know, not having held the weapon, not having, um, you know, looked down, looked down the hard sights and, and at a target 200 yards away. Maybe that's what. But you know, to, to a certain degree, that's the luck of the draw. Because, oh, it was a conscious you know, decision on my part, don't get me wrong. But, but I mean, <laughs> When you think about your military service, it was mm -hmm. the luck of it. You had a good pair of eyes, mm -hmm. you know, looking out for that mine that day. Had oh, that gone differently? That was the other guy. That was the guy that I patted on the back. So, <laughs> so let's make sure that that's clear. <laughs> no, I understand. But had that gone differently, right. you would have seen the things that, you know, that you wouldn't have wanted to see. As oh, no, no. Had it gone differently, I would be dead. Yeah. Quite frankly. Jeez. Well, and I think yeah. you got also look at the fact that some of the things you were doing probably saved some American lives. I hope so. What you were listening to, the message, the intelligence you were gathering and passing on, I have no doubt, saved American lives along the way. So you you might not have been in a foxhole, but you were mm -hmm. saving some of those guys that were I like on the to, ground. Yeah, I like to think so. One of the, one of the guys who was a, um, a ground pounder uh, we recently had uh, as a client at Shepard, um, <clears throat> He was trying to figure out what I did in the Navy, and I, and I told him, I said, I found the targets for you to kill. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I like to, I like to think that, that that was the case. I want to give you a chance before we finish to just say anything else you want to say about anything. To be sure nothing is left unsaid, or you know, anything you want to talk about. Or. I, th I think one, one thing, you know, 2004, um, I was running the photo desk um, and boss was out of town or something like that. So I was in the afternoon meeting, uh, in the budget meeting, deciding what was going to go in the paper. Not money budget, space right. budget. Um, and this is right around the time, it was either the day of or the day after that uh, four contractors that were all former SEALs that were killed in Fallujah. Um, and pictures of them strung up on the bridge were coming out and they were on the AP, they were on the wire. Because the photogra the Iraqi photographer um, who worked for the AP did a fantastic job of, of getting these, these horrific pictures. And I was really saddened by the um, decision. I was pushing to get this picture in the paper, um, somewhere in the paper, even, even on the national page on, on A4. Um, because it's so important to me for people to see and hear what our war fighters and what our, our military members who deploy experience and to know what the government, and don't get me wrong, I'm a, I'm a big supporter, I love my country, um, but to know what the votes that they cast go for. Mm -hmm. And I was, I was really upset that day when, when our executive editor decided not to run the picture anywhere. Um, and, and so to take away something if, if someone sees this and they've never been to war or never had a veteran in their family, <clears throat> um, 
to take away when you're saying thank you to someone who's been downrange and been to combat mm -hmm. and seen what, the, what no human being should see yeah. and done what no human being should do. Yeah. When you're saying that thank you, to literally pause, I mean stop, hold that person's hand when you're shaking it and look them dead in the eye and say thank you and hold it and mean it because a quick thank you is it's such an insult to that person's identity um, that I hope that that if you know people see or, or, or hear what I'm saying um, take away that they do that yeah. that's important to me that's a great message I wish we could transmit this to everybody in the country that's a yeah. Well, I can't tell you how much we appreciate you coming in here. You, you got a fascinating story, and Thanks. just like about every veteran we interview, you've you've short shrifted yourself because you've done a lot, <laughs> a lot more than you will say. I mean, number one, the just the brain power <clears throat> that it required to do what you did on the ship. Not everybody can do that, mm -hmm. and how important it was, as, as I mentioned before, protecting our lives our men's, men's and women's lives who are on the ground or in the air. I mean, it was, that was a position that not too many people could, could uh, fill with the skill you did, and you should be proud of that. Thank you. And just your whole attitude, uh, the attitude toward your, your fellow soldier and what you're doing now. I mean, good gosh, I mean, I wish I could pin a medal on your chest <laughs> for doing this because you're, you're helping so many people's lives. Thank you. But and your your courage during what you did not only on the ships but what you did as a, a member of the press uh, is something you should be proud of also. So. And that's one of the one of the things that I hold really really dear. It's like when we talk when I talk about beliefs and values with our clients or with with my clients to kind of like get the the nuts and bolts of of um, like where get back get their lives back on track basically. Yeah. Um, I always share my closest value is the First Amendment mm -hmm. because it's not just the freedom of and from religion, the freedom of assembly and all that stuff, but it's the freedom to carry the message because mm -hmm. the carrying the message is what keeps the government and keeps, and keeps people who we put in power honest. Right. And I, I trust to, you know, to some extent the folks that I voted for, even the folks that I didn't vote for, yeah. that they have my best interest at heart, but I always want someone questioning them. Because if no one's questioning them, we don't know what can happen. So that's one of my that's one of my strongest held beliefs. That's a true American belief. Or it, I hope so. If not, it should be. Yeah. Thank you. I well, thank you again so much, and I can't think of a better way to end this than on what you just said. It's just a great comment. Thank and you. Thank you for your service. Thank you for yours. Thank you. Absolutely. Absolutely.